Sometimes we used to get collected by a car supplied by Ratleys on hire to, to the council to come and pick us up first thing in the morning, about half past eight, and they used to collect all through to the top of the hill, to the top of the benches, and then take us to, up to Duncan School. And in the afternoons after school, he'd bring us back. And uh, sometimes, when the council was hired up for money, they 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 stopped the the, the bus, the, the car transport. I mean, literally had to walk from Littleton to Duncton, and then down through, and then back home in the evenings. And we did that. I can't remember exactly how long, we did, but I can remember my sisters and myself. My two older sisters uh, uh, walking down through from the top of Duncan Hill down f through the woods and coming out in the high street at Duncan, and then we'd have to go across uh, up the road. Then we had to cross a muddy old f field called the Sheep Wash, and then walk up into the up into the into the school. So how far a walk is that? Then? From Dog Kennels, it was a mile, two, mile and a half, two miles at least. Mm -hmm. to, to, to Littleton, from Littleton to Duncton was three, yeah. and it was about two and a half from Dog Kennels direct to, route, to Duncton mm -hmm. School. Direct, so it was about two two miles, I would have thought, yeah. So it was a bit of a, you know, and I always remember uh, my sisters, my uh, two hours, my mid elder sisters moaning, because they used to have a, a school parade on a Friday, and these they'd had, they'd had to walk down through the woods and everything else, and they got their dirty boots, and they were getting told off at the thing because their feet were muddy. Because <laughs> the teacher was um, she was called Miss Botting, and she was and she was a, she was the head teacher. They also had another teacher for the primary kids, the younger ones, and Miss Botting took the older. Children and they used to go to, to there were fifteen in them. Uh, it was just at the changeover when they started secondary school. You either after you were eleven, it was literally on that changeover. Uh, you went to Petworth uh, secondary, or the brighter ones went to Midas Grammar School mm. normally. Mm. But some. From the up north, uh, from the Benjes, they went to the high school in Chichester. So they got fragmented after that, and because Richard, he went to Petworth. I went, uh, oh. He went to Petworth secondary, mm -hmm. and my elder brother, he went to Middles Grammar School, and he would catch the train. He biked down to the Petworth station, which is. Just before, about a mile out of Petworth, uh, and that used to go through from Petersfield to, to Pawborough. Mm. And used to catch the train from there uh, to Midhurst and then come back in the evening and get on his bike and ride up. Same with Richard, he used to ride to, um, he used to cycle from Littleton to Petworth. Wow. Uh, and that was, but it was, it was. It was interesting the school because I mean, uh, in I remember the the other lady was called Miss Ratcliffe. She was a ginger head, very ginger curly hair she had, <laughs> and we, I remember her more than the other one really because she was much more civilized than Miss Botting. Miss Botting was a real old. Uh, Tyrant, <laughs> so harsh discipline. <laughs> Very disciplinarian, which was no bad thing, of course. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so it was tough times, and you go pretty, you know, it was very basic with the old desk, as Richard said, and uh, you lift up the ink wells, and you had old pens. You had to write. There was no biros and things in them days. It was, it was, it was. Uh, and how tough many going. children at the school, roughly? There must have been, in them days, there must have been, tw 
20 odd, 30 in the senior group, mm. and probably sort of 20 in the juniors. So 20, 50 or 60. 50 or 60, or 60 I would have thought, at, at most times. Yeah. And is that school it's, still there? It's not, the school is no longer as a school, it's, a, it's private houses now, but they've bu they built another school on what is called Willard's Close, uh, just to the west of where the school is now. Uh, and it's, it, they take all their kid children from, and they incorporate Grafham mm. into their church, into their school as well now. Mm. So it's got, they've got a big catchment area for them. Mm. I've no idea how many children are there, but it's a lot bigger than it ever was when we went sure, to school. Sure, yeah, sure. Yeah. After I left at 11, I didn't, unfortunately I didn't pass my 11 plus, so I had to go to a secondary school, and that was in Chichester, yes. And that must, have been, that must have been a big shock, really, from a little village oh. school, wasn't it? It was, uh, it was, it was certainly, certainly different, because, uh, uh, most of the others around there in the, in the school were all local lads around the town, all townies, you see. Well, we had come up from the middle of nowhere. <laughs> One of the teachers used to call me the Duncan Warrior. <laughs> Friendly, of course. But he, uh, yeah, he was, he was the gardener. I always remember he used to call me the Duncan Warrior. <laughs> yes, it was a, a culture shock to us. And, and back then, could you tell by the accents, whether people were from up here or from Chichester. Oh yeah, because yeah. we were, we were proper, we talked proper uh, sort of Sussex yokels, really. we were yokels. There's another thing about this, uh, it was um, our teacher, our, our English teacher at the, at the Lancaster, and we were doing, it, it, we were sort of talking and that, and, and he, he asked us to pronounce his thing, and it was a, I know, I always remember him, because I said, aim nay, brain care. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he just pulled his hair out, you weren't used to that sort of lingo, was he? <laughs> he said, what on earth is that? How now, brown cow? <laughs> and I said, well, where we come from, it's aim nay, brain care. <laughs> But uh, so over the years, of course, we've become a little bit more cultured in their thing. But it was a big difference in lang lingo. Mm. It was absolutely different to what the townie boys were. It was it it was primi basically primitive. In fact, as I said, in the same way as all the houses, we didn't have was there was no electricity here. We had no running water. We didn't get electricity until, in, until 1961, in fact, here. And running water, in fact, came, in fact, as I said, sort of around about the end of the 40s. But they had, they had outside to earth toilets, in fact, as I said, earth, earth closets for toilets at the back of the house at Littleton, at Upwalt, at dog kennels rather. The cottage we were in, there were two main bedrooms and there was a box room. So we lived and there were five, four or five of us. There were my eldest sister, eldest brother, myself, and then my eld second, second sister and then third sister, in fact, who were below me. In fact, we lived there and then we moved, as, as I said, from dog kennel cottages to little cottages. Downs. Yes. The oh, the crash on the downs and the war. Yes, yeah, it was. It was. I. There were several crashes around. In fact, on the downs. In fact, the first one that I remember, there was a Blenheim bomber crashed at the back of uh, Stickens Pits, as I said up here, and there was a Spitfire crashed in Warren, and the Lancaster that crashed. In fact, it said I remember quite well because that crashed on my birthday. And I remember as a child, we, after we went up to look at the crash site, sort of, and we collected various bits and pieces, in fact, as I said, from, from the aircraft. And that was the, fir that was the first one. Uh, Uncle Philip and the one other member, and 
George got sort of from the dog kennels and a, a, a naval rating who was happened to be passing by his motorcycle heard the crash. They went up and sort of pulled the pilot and, the, and one other passenger person from the aircraft out. They, he was still he was still alive at the time, but and that was uh, but he was taken to Chichester Hospital and unfortunately died. That was uh, that was the first one. The second one was the Dakota. In fact, um, apparently it was I discovered afterwards was a was a mail plane. It used to f fly from Grove in uh, near Wantage over to France, in fact, to take mail across and bring, bring it back. And they bring odd personnel as well, so sort of there. That was on its way back from France, and the crash investigators has, had made the assumption, in fact, as I said, so that they thought they were still over the channel, came down to sit to look, and they clipped trees at the back here and unfortunately cascaded into the wood and rolled over so it was said and we went we we were my family that was my sister myself and a couple of the tailors in fact were playing in the wood at the back of uh, of, of dubbing Dean. and my brother said oh that sounded like an aircraft crash and we subsequently heard that that's what had happened. My uncle's, uh, un uncle and a couple of other people went to the crash site, but by then, in fact, everything was, the, was it was on fire and they, there were obviously no survivors. And I can distinctly remember going there afterwards and seeing bits of the plane all, over, all, crash, all around, in amongst the trees and, and it, the surprising thing, which was as a child, I noticed there were there were sweets. In fact, as I said, in in amongst the you know fr which had come from the air aircraft on the ground. In fact, as I said, which was to me totally you know strange. But uh, there was nothing. As, as I said, we, they cleared away the aircraft of the Lancaster and the. Dakota, they cleared away relatively quite quickly. So, but that is is my er, earliest mem memories of, of that. In fact, as I said, I was ten at the time. Yes, I was. No, no, I was eight at the time. Sort of said of the of the Dakota. That was in 1944, 45, 45. So I was eleven. That's right. No, ten, nine. I'll get it right <laughs> in the end. During the war, the downs up here, in fact, I said, which was Westwood Downs, I said, sort of an upwater down here, were used by the army for manoeuvres prior to D Day. So, for about two years prior to that, in fact, as I said, so that there was the army were continuously operating, operating here. And they were mainly based at Duncton, Grafham, sort of, and uh, down up West Burton. So you build, they build these lambing pens, big outside, big square pen with bowels to keep them, and then they put a roof on the top of it, sort of thing. And I remember they're all these penned up, and then they'd run them into the, you know, they. He'd, he'd look after them and give birth, and they also used to have a, a students from, I'm not sure where they come from, I think it was London, I think they come from, Veterinary College in London, they used to get these students uh, come and help for, for, you know, it's obviously, you know, it's a good thing for the, for the, for the student, veterinary students, they used to come and stay with my Uncle Greg and Auntie Jenny, and they do the sort of day work, and Uncle Uncle used to do the nights. So it was very interesting at that time of coming down here and going around the pens and observing what was happening. And then in the that was that part of the year sort of thing. In the summer, we used to have a great time in the summer. 
because in them days you, it was compulsory to dip your sheep. And the sheep dip was just to the west of here, in the little, there was a, there's a little public footpath actually now, but it was a little, uh, little valley type thing, only a shallow thing, and it was just right to put the, put the dip in there, you see, so you drove the sheep in from the top and pushed them out the bottom, go and push, you had to make them all enclosed, so the sheep had to go through to get to the other side. So of course you have to round up all your sheep from wherever they were on the farm. I can remember being, coming down the road with herds of sheep. Luckily the traffic in them days was not like it is today. Goodness me, they wouldn't allow it to die, I suppose. But we used to have to drive them down the road and then wherever the thing. And the same with the cows, when we were moving cows around. As a youngster, I remember uh, they used to move their cows around and you had to, to take them up the road on the... Because I remember driving a load of cows, uh, heifers I suspect they were at the time, because uh, they didn't have enough food up Littleton, when, we lived at, when I lived at Littleton, uh, taking uh, about 30 heifers down onto some keep, what they call keep, you know, keep ground at um, what is now Seaford College. We had to take them all the way down Duncan Hill, around the corner, and then up through to West to, to West Arrington there. Oh, what about sheep shearing? Sheep shearing? Because there used to be gangs of sheep shearers, didn't there? Yeah. I, funny enough, I can't remember a lot about the sheep shearing, but I know they they it, it, that was a big thing, of course, because you had to you had to sheep, and in them days, sheep was wolves was much more uh, a ha asset to to the farmers in them days because it was they had a good sale for them and priors in Chichester with a big uh, sheep wool 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 people they called, cause they called it the wool staplers and that was in Chichester they had a big depot there the priors and yeah I can't remember because they used to must have I can only assume that they, they didn't used to do much themselves. They used to have to get preferred, you know, professional gangs in, even in them days, going around doing the shearing. Because I remember my uncle, he, he used to show his sheep, and he, he's, he won several prizes here, there and everywhere. It's for the Royal Show and the Sussex County Show, and he, he won quite a few. And uh, Findon Sheep Fair? Yeah, they used to go. Yeah, I remember going to the Finden Sheep Fair with my father and uh, when we were at Littleton, because they used to sell all their sheep in the September time. Yeah, it must have been around about September time. They'd, they'd take, trog them off over to um, Finden Fair. Yeah, I remember going there a couple of times with my father. I don't remember a lot about it, but I remember going there. And of course, my, my uncle used to sort of Used to clip out his, have to clip, you know, I remember him sort of clipping out his, uh, tarting up his, they used to do their bottoms and tails and, well, there's never many tails on them, those used to cut them off, but they clip them out and get them all smartened up and rubbed down and combed out and for pre presentation. And as I say, he was, a, yeah, he was quite, um, quite well thought of in the South Down Sheep World. I think he was president club of the South Down Society at one stage, it was a big noise. Mm. I'll say he did have the biggest, reputed to have the biggest flock of South Downs in the country at that time, around about 600, mm. 600 breeding ewes. And but the, the South Downs gradually died out, didn't they, as a breed? Well, they, they, did, they did get loose favour because they were a little bit on the small side, Although they're very tasty to eat, they tell me, and I presume I've eaten plenty myself in the time I spent, but they are, they were, they weren't uh, uh, viable when people, when the, you know, when supermarkets started to come along and more people were buying meat after the war, they had more money, they were buying, you know, it, it, they became obsolete. But of course, it, they still, they still exist, and they're making a bit of a comeback these days, because I remember 
uh, he's some of his stock, one of his prize rams, was bought bought and sent out to New Zealand. So there's a little bit of up awesome in New Zealand, <laughs> in New Zealand no doubt. And he, yes, because he was very good. And what about the pig farming? There's a photograph you've got of pigs there. Yeah, the pig farming, I can't remember the pigs uh, on, on Littleton. I remember the pigs at, at, uh, when I lived at, uh, at, on the farm at Littleton, because I, I used to go on out weekends. I used to help the old pigmen. That was, you know, he'd go out and feed all the pigs. You had to mix up the, you had all the meal. And you had to go around and feed the pigs. It was all, you was ankle deep, <laughs> knee deep, rather, more like in mud. It was, you know what kids are like? It was right up here street. But I remember doing, yeah, you'd have to move. You'd have to move and keep moving around the field. Because it got so bad, it, it couldn't, you'd have to keep moving the sheds along at various times. And it, that, that was, uh, they just literally brought them on. And so how, since then, has there been a change from livestock to arable? Uh, well, yeah, because uh, I don't know why, but, I've, you know, farm changes, don't they? They decided to get rid of the pigs, but they always had a milking herd at Littleton. And... They got rid of their pigs and that, never saw them again. They just concentrated on the, the of influx of sheep from Bigner to get them fresh ground and change the scenery. But basically it then became, then he got rid of the, a lot of the sheep and it was literally became uh, a milking herd with, with um, beef cattle on running at the same time. So well, there's a lot less dairy farming now, isn't there? Oh, this, um, unfortunately, uh, they've just given up uh, the, the, da the dairy herd at Littleton in, in this wind, just gone. It's, it's a tough old game, uh, dairy farming at the minute. And the, the I don't know the reason why. I, well, I can, I can only imagine that it become unviable, and uh, he's now given up the herd. So, what was uh, a milking herd been there for years? It's now longer. Yeah, it's a bit of a shame, really. So, what's farmed mainly? Mainly, now? it's now it's all it's all literally uh, wheat, and barley, Ma mainly, and maize. Well. Put it this way, he had been growing maize because he'd both grown maize to feed his uh, cattle in the winter. With no cattle, he's not going to grow maize up here. So he, it'll all go back to wheat and barley, but the majority of it will be. But wheat that will be grown up here and eat now. I don't remember the 47 one, I don't know much about that. What about the winter of 47, how tough was it? Yeah, see, <laughs> the winter of 47 I, I remember quite, quite well. It, it was, uh, we, it, I, I can remember in fact, because that was the year I took my 11 plus at Duncton and uh, the, I went to, to, to take the, my, Exa the uh, examination to see whether I could go to the grammar school in February, and it it was r it rained. It was very cold. All of the trees, in fact, sort of were covered with ice, and we were warned not to go into the woods because branches were breaking off. And then it snowed, and the snow came sort of, and it lasted until the end of March. It was very cold. The road from uh, Autumn to East Dean, in fact, as I said, was about four, it was in about four feet of snow and it was blocked for quite a number of, quite a number of months. And the only way, in fact, that they got anything down there was to take a tractor down there to the cottages down Broke Lane and, and also here. And it was we it was for children. It was wonderful because we used to go made it made sledges and s 
skied all over the skidded all over the downs. In fact, as I said, sort of for quite a number of years. For, you know, over all the over all of that time. And the school, in fact, as I said, was, was open, in fact, as I said. And I think, in fact, as I said, we, we only missed two days of schooling. Otherwise, in fact, as I said, because the taxi couldn't come and collect us. The girl over the road, in fact, actually walked to school on the worst of the days. But, uh, as I said, and that was prior to the time, in fact, where we were forced to walk to school because of, of distancing from the school. But this, the winter was there, and there was down... Um, when the uh, snow started to melt, in, 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 in snow started to melt, there was a lady lived in the cottage down the road here, and there were Flood was water, flood, not deep water, but there was water flooded everywhere in the road and things like that. And there was a report in the newspaper, which in fact it said I subsequently read afterwards, and it said a woman drowns in river at Atwatham. But what had happened was she'd fallen over and knocked herself out and drowned in, in, in very shallow water. That was the only thing sort of, that I, I can remember there. But 47 was bad for everybody. The second time I remember bad snow, which was in... I had just joined the Royal Air Force. That would have been 1952. And uh, I can remember walking up into it in my Easter leave period. In fact, going up to the woods at Farm Hill with father, in fact, to digging sheep out of the snow, in fact, as I said. So, so, uh, so that, which was, which was, as I said, it was difficult for them. But it wasn't, it, the, the trees, in fact, as I said, branches fell down, sort of, and the road from Chichester to Petworth was closed for, for uh, one or two days, not very long. But, in fact, as I said, it was, uh, all I can remember was it was cold and stayed below freezing, sort of, more or less, sort of, from, from early February until the end, end of March. Okay. It, it snowed on Boxing Night, oh. and it was, he woke up the next morning, it was horrendous. <laughs> the, the, the roads were, were completely blocked with about two or three foot of snow. And, and they, they did quickly open this main road, uh, the council workers. Unlike today, they see a bit of snow and they all hide. They used to, I know the old, I used to know one of, a couple, one of the old drivers used to love the snow because they, they'd be parked up on top of white waste lodges or of Duncan Hill or some of the benches, ready to clear the road to see. It was an extra bonus because they got overtime, double time working nights. They used to love it. But they did, they did do a good job, even though there was a lot of snow. They did clear it up. They could make, keep the road open all the time because after that big main snow, we didn't get any more snow on top of it, luckily. But there was... But it, it literally, it was... It, it stayed was, cold, though, didn't it? Oh, it was cold. cold. It was cold for ages. I remember I just started... I, I used to drive a cart, and I had a little motor. I was working in Jitster at the time, so a youngster. And uh, I remember having to sort of... I used to have to drain it out. My motor used to drain it out every night, because uh, even the antifreeze one suitable. I used to have to drain this thing out, drain my water out of my car every night, and fill it up every morning. <laughs> Just, and I used to park it out opposite on a rise, so I could get a bump start it down the hill, because <laughs> the battery was <laughs> the batteries weren't strong enough to turn the car over hardly. I used to park it opposite the farm up at Littleton, and run it down the the chute. To get it started mornings, because I couldn't get, because it wouldn't start on the battery. 
but I used to have to do that. I did that for several more, several, several, several weeks before it thawed out sufficiently that I could actually leave the water in and, in and start my car up next morning. But it was it was very difficult for everybody around here in them days because I mean all the pipes and the dairy used to freeze. The cowmen used to start at five o'clock in the morning. They'd have to get up there and thaw water out. They'd blow lamps and. Gosh knows what you can imagine, can't you? Mm. It was really, really tough. Mm. Yeah, and it was, I say, it was, I remember it, it was, there was still snow in the gully up at Tigley's, between Tigley's and Littleton Farm, there's a gully, what used to be an old road, I suppose, years, donkey's years ago, or well, boundary. And, it was, and there was snow in there in, June. Really? Yeah, it was still snow in that little gully in June, and it was still about a foot deep. Wow, that's something. Isn't so it? That, that tells you how much snow there was in there, and how long it was, how cold it was during that period, because it froze absolutely solid. Mm. And it was. I remember walking up there with my father, and it was. It was absolutely still snow in June mm. in that little gully because it's sheltered by trees. I mean, it was what, six foot, seven foot gully, yeah. and I expect where it all blown in there, and I expect, I, expect, I can't remember at the time, it probably didn't go up there, it didn't go out, it didn't go charging around in, in there because it was difficult to get about. I presume that was pretty much full up, uh, all that when, when it first got in there, and it was still there in June. Yeah. I do remember that. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. it was tough. But the, we, Everybody, all the kids, all the buses, they, were, they didn't miss, I don't think they missed about a day's, they had missed about a day's school in them, because my sister used to go to, uh, she was going to, the, she was going to the Lancastrian then, and she hardly missed, because she was fed up, because she had to go to school. <laughs> she thought she was going to get out of school for weeks, she had about a day off, that was about all, you know. That's how it was in them days. They didn't, they didn't mess about. They used to keep the old road clean and tidy. They used to soon come round and bought the old snow ploughs and gritters, and they'd get out and have to show it off by hand at times. And you know, and sort of that. They was, and they'd be up on the back because they didn't have spreaders. They didn't have spreaders on the back in them days. They had three or four blokes up in the back of their trucks throwing the grit out. <laughs> Yeah, and that was in, what, 50s, 60s. So, yeah, it's moved on a lot since then, hasn't it? <laughs> yes, yes. But I can remember him standing up at the back of that, flinging out her old grit onto the salt, onto the road. And it wasn't, it was grit, it wasn't salt, it was just grit. Salt-wise was, a new, was a, more of a modern thing these days, mm. but it was literally lumps of grit. And they used to give them the grit. Yeah, it was interesting. My mother, she was a jolly good cook. How she ever managed to control the heat? Uh, you can imagine the people <laughs> these days, they, they got switch on the electrics, it tells you exactly what the temperature is. Here you are, it depended on how much wood you put in, <laughs> what the temperature in the oven was. So you put too much wood in, you get too hot. <laughs> it, was, it was a fine art, her, her cooking, and she was a jolly good she made excellent cakes and did cooking. Yeah, so we didn't, we, didn't, we were lucky really, because I mean, in those days, we, father was, in the winter, he, he was farm foreman, but in the winter, he'd spend all his time catching rabbits. So we never went short of meat in the, when we were nippers. We, we were the lucky ones, really, because we did, you know, some people, you know, he used to send, I remember used to wrap up, a, catch a rabbit and wrap them up in paper and send them to my auntie who lived in, near Addingston in Surrey, in, 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 in a normal post, wrapped up in paper, brown paper, tightly and thing, and send them off, and they'd arrive in the next day, you see. You can yeah. send something like that these days, you wouldn't get it for a week. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't know what you were going to get at the end of these days, but you used to get it the next day, sort of thing. 
he used to give it to the postman, and the postman would sort of post it for him, he'd give him the money next day or whatever. It was, you know, but that's, you know, so we didn't, but he used to get, you know, so we used to live happily ever after on rabbits, because I remember sort of being, uh, when I was at school, little nipper, I used to have to, I used to love going out with him, of course, and it was cold, freezing cold, we used to do it from sort of November till beginning of February. You had three months, four months of intensive rabbit catching. He didn't used to do much farm work. He literally spent all his time catching rabbits in wires and traps and ferreting. He'd do his, do his rounds in the morning with, with the snares and the, and the traps. Then he'd go around smaller places with his ferrets. And because the place used to crawl alive with ferrets, uh, rabbits, sorry. There was a lot of rabbits. And over one season, and unfortunately I was stupid because I threw out the records when we cleared out, when he, when he moved out. Eventually he had to die and move, and he moved and then he died. Uh, he, I threw away the sort of receipts you used to get because it was a firm from Worthing used to come up every other day through the winter and pick up the rabbits from around the area and you used to have to put them in a little uh, receipt book. You don't know what the firm's called, do you? Oh, I can't remember, I can't remember, I can't. I just cannot remember what they were. Were I can't I can't remember the name unfortunately. No, that's right, that's right. But, but um, I know. He, what about he, mole catching? Yeah, we used to do that. But I'll go back to the rabbits. One year, he caught almost twenty thousand rabbits in that period. He he missed it by he missed twenty two thousand. 20,000 by a cat's whisker. That's how many rabbits there was around here. And he used to have to put them... I remember he, he, was a, he, wanted, he was a stocky man, about five foot ten. But he was tough. And he'd have a, a rabbits, he'd have a hazel stick, and he'd have, God knows how many rabbits in front and on the back. And he used to have to march them off the hill. He didn't have... He didn't have tractors or anything, he used to walk it all. And he, and literally, you imagine how much white he had to carry around them. <laughs> and uh, it, was, it was, yeah, it was amazing what, what, he, what, what the rabbit population was. Mm -hmm. And myxomatosis, well of course, in them, before myxomatosis, they sort of used to keep the downland, uh, like a, I remember walking on some of that downland in that time, in the early 50s. It was like walking on sponge. It was beautiful downland turf, is what they call it. Mm. Of course, once the rabbits swim, it didn't take very long for all these open hills that were before, because so, only some of them were done, were reclaimed after the, directly after the war. They didn't actually get the majority of these hills that you see around here now, they didn't get cleared until the 60s. As well as catching the rabbits, in those days there was a good market for fox skins, badger skins and mole skins. And my father used to catch all of them in the traps and wires, snares and wires, and well, of course, the moles, which is rat, mole traps. But he used to skin them, he used to skin out the badgers, skin out the, the foxes, and skin out the thing, and that was a little bit of pin money for him. The farmer didn't eat, the farmer was quite happy for him to have that. He didn't used to have any control over the rabbits, so he all had to go to the game dealer. But he, had, he used to do the skinning and send them off to Horace Friend at Wisbeach in Cambridgeshire. And he used to get anything from some sort of, I forget what it was now. Mole skins used to be 10 pence each. Yeah, 10 pence. They all vary. It depends on the market, you see. It all varies. Some, some, some years you get a pound for a fox skin, another thing you might get five, 
fall apart, we need to fall shillings. But he, he needs to make a little bit on the side, you know that. You need a lot of moleskins to be able to make anything, wouldn't you? Oh, yeah, but there was a lot of moles about. <laughs> right. There's still a lot of moles about. I don't... Uh, I, I don't have any trouble with mole, moles on my lawn. I've put, <laughs> luckily, there is plenty of moles about. They're a nuisance to the farmers, of course, especially with the rain making and things like that. You get a good half a bale of uh, bailed up or soil, ain't much good for a bale of hay. <laughs> so that's why the farmers don't like them. If it, you know, it was, it was uh, interesting that uh, you could make a. Well, people did make a living out of it, but. Uh, mole catching and stuff like that. You, you, you know, some of these old boys, old country boys, they didn't do nothing else. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they could just about scrape a living. <laughs> I don't want to give it existence rather than living, I presume. Yeah. But it was, it was, it was interesting that he used to sort of we used to. I, I mean, we were all inherited those skills of rabbiting and what have you. We we're still country boys. I can't tell you what we do, <laughs> but we still enjoy country pursuits, put it that way. <laughs> and we still got our old hands, we can still keep our old hands in skinning this and skinning that and plucking this and plucking that. Because, uh, you know, what's better than, uh, I'm very fond of pheasant, partridge and vents and the rabbit. <laughs> And I do it all my, still do it all myself. I don't have to rely on a butcher to to, to uh, supply my meat and <laughs> things like that. So I'm quite happy to to um, do what my old dad taught me. Yes. As regards dressing out this, that, and the other. <laughs> a lot of people wouldn't, wouldn't even well frighten the life out of them. They wouldn't know where to, where to start, would they? <laughs> if it's not wrapped up in a cellophane wrapper from a supermarket, they don't want to know. You know we're, we're slightly different. That's old country boys still. Okay. Excellent.